Our topic this morning is the warrior's prayer unto victory. And I'll be reading Numbers 1035 and Psalm 68, 1 to 2. So it was, whenever the ark set out, that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. Let your enemies be scattered. And let those who hate you flee before you. And then Psalm 68, 1 to 2. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away as wax melts before the fire. So let the wicked perish at the presence of God. In Numbers 10.35, we have the formula for the people of God setting out from their camp on their journey in the wilderness toward the promised land. The people were organized as a holy army that was to bring destruction on the seven Canaanite nations. And if you look into it further, you'll see that the tribes were organized and we had kind of a cube marching toward the promised land, very symbolic. The destruction would be delayed, of course, due to Israel's unbelief, and then they would end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But after 40 years of wandering, it would begin. The conquest of the seven Canaanite nations. There is much in this chapter which holds a symbolic or typical significance in that the ultimate victory over God's enemies would be accomplished through Jesus Christ, the divine human mediator. Remember, Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus, and Joshua would be the head of the conquering army who would conquer the seven Canaanite nations, which is symbolic of Jesus Christ, the resurrected theanthropic mediator who conquers the whole planet Earth through his church, through the spiritual sword that proceeds out of his mouth, the mouth of the white horse rider in Revelation chapter 19. Chapter 19 is not described the second coming of Christ. It describes, uh, it's a recapitulation of what takes place during the period between the resurrection of Christ and the second coming. Now this point was understood by the Jews even before the coming of Christ. For the Jerusalem Targum paraphrases this verse as, Rise up now, O word of the Lord. O word of the Lord. Also the Targum of Jonathan says, Be revealed now, O word of the Lord. The expression word of the Lord was another name or expression for the coming Messiah, who was called by the Jews before the coming of Christ, the word the one to reveal God. And it's interesting, uh, if you read, you can read uh, in Jewish writings before the coming of Christ that there were Jews who believed that the Messiah would be divine. All of that will change after Christ comes when they they alter their religion to make it more specifically anti-biblical and anti-Christian. Jesus is the word or the word of the Lord, the word of God, the Messiah, who by his incarnation and manifestation in the flesh achieved a perfect redemption which resulted in his exaltation, the end of which was to destroy all his and all his people's enemies. That's why Christ came. He came for perfect victory, including the devil and the devil's minions. Therefore, when we look at this passage, we must... Keep in mind two different but related applications. The one regards the work of the church and spiritual conquest. The sword that proceeds out of the mouth that cuts his enemies asunder is the gospel and the whole word of God, whereby we conquer the nations. They bow the knee to Christ and they subject themselves to him and then they covenant with him and the nations are covenanted with Christ, whole nations, and they establish biblical Christianity as their official religion and that is how he conquers the nations. That's one way. The other would apply, um, well, the other would apply to a Christian state going into a just war against an enemy of God. If you had a Christian state, and they are going to, let's say, have a war with Muslims who had killed some Christian missionaries or whatever, and they declared war on the Muslims, this would be the perfect prayer. 
but we'll discuss this in detail below. And we also have to mention that Christ, of course, judges by the rod. He conquers by the spirit, which changes hearts, which regenerates hearts and causes people to bow the knee to Jesus Christ voluntarily. And he conquers by the rod who shatters disobedient rulers and nations into pieces. Which, so it's either submit or it's be judged. And we've included in our text Psalm 68, 1-2, which is clearly an allusion to Numbers 10.35. We see that David, speaking by the Holy Spirit, does not restrict the passage to extraordinary holy wars of annihilation against the Canaanites, but applies it to the enemies of the theocracy in his own day. And the psalm, we've, two of the psalms we sang this morning uh, tie into this theme very clearly where the people are asking God to judge his enemies. God, rise up, judge your enemies. Many notable scholars connect its message to Psalm 118, which speaks of the victory, authority, and dominion of Christ received at his resurrection. And uh, virtually all scholars are in agreement that the uh, Jews would sing, the last psalm they would sing at the Passover was Psalm 118. And therefore the last song that Jesus sang before he died on the cross after the, he had stood to the Lord Holy Supper was Psalm 118. Although David speaks of his own day, he also speaks prophetically and looks beyond the present actions and types under the great mysteries of Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven and to the special privileges of the Christian church and to the calling of the Gentiles unto God. <clears throat> the white horse rider go, rides forth and the sword proceeds out of his mouth that two-edged sword, the word of God. And verse 1 is but a slight variation of the words used by Moses in Numbers 10.35. The four verbs used here, by the way, are exactly the same as the verbs used in Numbers 10.35. They're identical in the Hebrew. Now, as we examine these passages, there are a number of things to note for our edification. First, they presuppose that power for victory the ground of confidence is the presence of God among his people. The ark represented the presence of Jehovah among the covenant nation. The Shekinah presence dwelt above the mercy seat, between the cherubim. And the ark, in a sense, was a replica of the throne of God in heaven. So you have the ark. And you have the special presence of God hovering above the ark, and then, of course, the temple is filled with smoke, which represents God's presence. Jehovah dwells in the midst of his people. He dwells in the midst of his mighty angels. And if you read Revelation, you read other throne room scenes, uh, God is surrounded by his mighty angels. And that's what the ark, that's one of the things it represents. <clears throat> and by the way, when they sprinkle the blood on the Day of Atonement on the mercy seat, what was inside the ark? Well, you, of course, you had the, the, the rod that budded, and you had a copy of the Ten Commandments, and God was interposing the blood of the perfect sacrificial animal in between the mercy seat and the presence of God, thus uh, satisfying the justice of God's moral law. In the ancient world, military victory was believed to be the victory of one God over another. And if you go back and you read uh, when they conquered Israel and they got the ark, they put it in the temple of Dagon, showing that they believed that their god Dagon had given them the victory over Jehovah. And then, of course, God caused Dagon to fall on his face and shatter apart and, and struck them with tumors. The Jews understood that there was only one true and living God and that victory in battle was totally dependent on him. On many occasions, the Jews were vastly outnumbered, and their opponents had superior military hardware. And we, we see uh, in the Bible that they were restricted, and that God did not want them to have a bunch of horses, to multiply horses. God did not want them to have a bunch of chariots. And there's one battle where David conquers a vast army that had many, many chariots and many, many horses, and what did David do? 
they cut the hamstring of the horses. They, they, they rendered the horses, uh, they basically killed the horses, so they would not be tempted to use them in battle. They were to depend on Jehovah as their strength. They were to depend on Jehovah to go before them and bring them the victory, even though they had uh, not as good as military hardware, and they very often had fewer numbers. It was Jehovah who brought them their victories. If they had faith in God and their covenant relationship with him, and they exhibited that faith by obedience to the covenant law, God would bless them and give them victory over their enemies. And that's one of the great themes of the Old Testament, of course, as a type of the church conquering the world. The importance of God's presence can be seen in God's promise to Joshua to encourage him in his duties. This is Joshua 1, 5 to 6. Here's Jehovah speaking to Joshua. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. The Lord is with you as the God of power. And it is that power which will give you the ability and success wherever you go and whatever you do to conquer the enemies of God. The fact that God's presence shall never be withdrawn is an assurance of continued help unto success. The church needs the presence of God when it begins its work and while it continues its work of salvific dominion. So we're dependent on God's presence. We're dependent on God's favor for dominion. For any, many enemies will arise to overthrow that work and throw the people of God into chaos. But if God is with us, our enemies will not be able to stand against us. If God is with us, who can be against us? And Jesus, by the way, quotes Joshua and tells his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a quote directly from the book of Joshua. The key to spiritual victory is the abiding presence of Christ in us through his spirit. Therefore, Jesus taught his disciples that, John 15, 5, that apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That Christ's presence is the enabling promise of victory and encouragement can be seen in his final sentence of the Great Commission given to his disciples. Matthew 28, 20b. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Because it's an achievement of a perfect redemption, Jesus, the divine human mediator, has received all authority over heaven and earth. Thus, he is in charge of saving, sanctifying, and protecting his people. He has the name that is above every name. He is the judge who destroys the enemies of God's people. And you're going to either bow to Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow to Jesus, Philippians chapter 2. You're either going to bow voluntarily in worship and praise, or you're going to bow involuntarily in fear and dread as you're judged by Jesus Christ in the day of judgment and in temporal judgments in history. When we ask God to rise up against their enemies, we ask the theanthropic king to dash them in pieces with a rod of iron. Yes, we pray for their salvation. Yes, we pray for God to save people. But if God does not, if they are not saved, if they reject the gospel, we shake our, the dust off and we pray imprecatory prayers against them that God would destroy them. You should not be voting for President Obama. You should be praying for his destruction. You should not be uh, supporting Hillary Clinton. You should be praying for her destruction. Now, why do I say that? Because they know the gospel. They hate the gospel. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate the word of God. They hate biblical Christianity. And they are doing everything they can to destroy it in this nation. And if you vote for any Democrat, or you vote for Obama, or you vote for Hillary Clinton, you should be excommunicated. That we do not ignore or downplay the importance of Christ's presence, Jesus made his statement in the Greek very emphatic. His statement in Greek literally reads, I with you am I, meaning I, even I myself, am with you. 
Okay, in Greek, you, when you say something, you don't have to have the word I, it's, it's in the verb. So when you do add the word I, you're, you're making it exceptionally emphatic. This promise was given to a small body of believers who were very feel, fearful of the authorities. They had all abandoned Christ. They had all fled. They had all hid away. They had hidden themselves because of the opposition of the Jews and the Roman authorities. And then just a short time later in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, these men who cowered in fear receive the Holy Spirit and they become mighty warriors. Every single one of them will, will die for Christ as a martyr except for the Apostle John. And he spent a good bit, deal of time on Patmos, uh, an island off the coast of Turkey. And if you've seen Patmos, it's not a very pleasant place to stay and it's very likely that he lived in a cave. Not very pleasant. Christ commands these cowardly disciples who had very recently all failed him to take the gospel and the whole counsel of God and disciple all nations. The whole world is to be brought into subjection to the glorified king. And they were commanded to start in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and the very city where the corrupt officials had arrested Jesus and condemned him to death on false evidence. Yeah, you're going to start in Jerusalem where the people that are your greatest enemies, that hate the gospel the most, that are most likely to kill you, that's where you're going to start. They were to put their lives on the line in a city full of people who hated Christ and had asked for his execution. They could expect no protection whatsoever from the Roman authorities. Now, they were pragmatists. They didn't really care about Christians or Jews which way or the other. All they wanted was political peace. That's all they wanted, and if that meant killing some Christians, so be it. How do they expect success with the gospel against such vehement, hostile opposition? The satanic opposition was well-funded. They had the army behind them. They had the police. They had the authority. They had the civil magistrate. They were exceptionally organized. They were backed by the most powerful empire in the world. Yet these disciples were to have faith that Jesus' spiritual presence with them guaranteed success. The glorious hope comes not by might, nor by human military power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Zechariah 4, 6b. The implications of this presence are obvious. We must have courage and have an optimistic view of the church's future. Because we don't achieve the victory. Christ will achieve the victory. And our, we are to have faith and obey. We don't trust in our abilities. We don't trust in how wonderful we are. Because we're a bunch of rotten, filthy bums in God's sight apart from Christ. We trust in what Jesus Christ has done and the efficacy of his death and resurrection. He is ruling right now at the right hand of God. He is ruling the nations. And if the nations don't bow, if they don't submit, if they kill us, if they persecute us, he will exact vengeance upon them and he will crush them as one crushes grapes in a wine press. And their blood will be splattered, figuratively speaking, on our clothes. When God destroyed Israel in AD 70, and he did it for rejecting Christ, and he did it for them persecuting the church, they were the first great persecutors of the church. Rome's persecutions were sporadic, and they were usually local until Nero and Trajan. But the Jews were very active in persecuting the church from city to city. And literally, literally, the steps that ran down the temple were drenched in blood. Blood literally ran down those steps as the people were slaughtered. Christ will be with us until the world comes to its present end. So have hope. So our success, our success is dependent on God with us. It is dependent on Jesus Christ with us by his spirit. That brings us the victory.
not protesting abortion clinics and depending on human means, but by preaching the gospel, planting churches, and the whole counsel of God. <clears throat> Second, the passage under our consideration makes it very clear that Jehovah himself has many enemies. Jehovah has many enemies. And <clears throat> one thing you notice singing the Psalms, it's full of talking about enemies. It's full of talking about God taking vengeance on his enemies. It's full of passages talking about, uh, Lord, do something against their enemies. We're hurting here. Do something. They are described as those who hate God. Everyone who refuses to submit to God to believe in him or obey the word of God is an enemy of God. Everybody who says to the gospel, nah, that's not for me. I reject that. I don't believe in Christ. Yeah, he may have been a nice guy, but that's not for me. Everybody who does that is an enemy of God. If you don't believe in Christ, you're an enemy of God. Often in scripture, the enemies of God are set in parallel to the wicked. In Psalm 68, the enemies of verse one are described um, as the wicked in verse two. Because a man's faith and worldview is unseen, they're not visible, the enemies of God are described as those who rage against God and break his commandments. Those who bow down to false gods are described in the second commandment as those who hate me, Exodus 20, verse 5, and Deuteronomy 5, 9. Look, if you don't worship the true God through Jesus Christ, it's not a matter of neutrality. The Bible says very clearly, you hate God. If you don't worship the true and living God through Jesus Christ, the Bible says you hate God. You're a hater of God. You're an enemy of God. The wrath of God abides on you right now. God hates the workers of iniquity. Every day. Those who reject the covenant and God's commandments are described as those who hate Jehovah in Deuteronomy 7, 9 to 11. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which I command you today to observe them. That's a pretty radical warning. If you've got faith in me, you're going to keep my statutes, my laws, my ordinances. You're not going to depart from the commandments of God. And if you don't keep them, then I know you don't have faith in me. I know you don't believe in me. You're an idolater. And I'm going to judge you. I'm going to pay you back right to your face. It's radical. In Psalm 82, verse 5, Asaph describes them as they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. In Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, Paul describes them as those who walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who bring past feeling, have given themselves over to lawlessness, to work all uncleanliness, uncleanness with greediness. I want you to think about that. I mean, think about this. 40% of evangelicals voted for President Obama. And, and you, you young people who were tempted to look up to these movie stars in, in Hollywood and uh, rock stars and so forth. These are degenerate haters of God. They're the enemies of God. They're the enemies of the church. They're the enemies of Christ. They're vile. God hates their guts. And God is going to crush them as one crushes a grape under his foot. You have to have a biblical perspective on reality. Yes, we pray for the conversion of people. But if they reject the gospel, if they reject Christ, we pray for their destruction. Obama, think about this. President Obama has done more against Christians in this nation than Osama bin Laden. That's true. 
when he promotes sodomite rights and sodomite marriage, and he promotes abortion, and he says, you're going to get this health care plan by the government, and you're going to pay for us to kill babies. We're going to demand your money to pay to kill babies. He's doing more to persecute the Christian church and to, do, to work against it than Osama bin Laden. Oh, yeah, who's, I'm sure he's killed some Christians, there's no question. But Obama is doing great damage that is lasting damage. In Romans 1, the apostle says they are ungodly and unrighteous, and they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, 118. The apostle John describes them as antichrists, plural, as part of the evil world system, 1 John 2, 15 to 17 and 4, 3. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. There's no fence sitting in God's universe. You're either on the side of Jesus Christ, keeping the commandments of God, working for godly dominion, working for the gospel, working for the Bible as the infallible word of God, or you're an enemy of Jesus Christ. You're an antichrist. The enemies of this world and the covenant children of Satan, God's chief enemy. They are the covenantal children of the devil if you do not follow Christ. Jesus said it right to the face of the Pharisees, the most religious people of that day, the fundamentalists of that day who had a false doctrine of salvation and therefore they rejected their Messiah because they did not want to humble themselves and believe in blood atonement. They rejected Christ because they didn't want to admit they were sinners. They rejected Christ because they didn't want to say, yes, I'm a vile, rotten sinner. I'm worthless in God's sight. I'm a piece of excrement. All my works are excrement in God's eyes. Therefore, I need you, Jesus Christ. They didn't want to do that. And therefore, Jesus told them to their face, you are of your father, the devil. They are those who are the children of Adam, not the second Adam. They are dedicated to the flesh and the evil world system. From the moment that God introduced special grace into this post-fall world, there has been a radical antithesis between the people of the devil and the people of this world and the people of Christ, the people of God. Or we could say the people of faith and the people of this world. Cain hated his brother Abel and killed him rather than submit to God. Hatred of Jehovah and his Christ is the naturally sinful expression of two contrary and opposite religions, philosophies, and worldviews. So you can have all the religious talk and get up there like Obama and go to the prayer breakfast and tell everybody you're a Christian and all this stuff when you're nothing but a rotten, filthy antichrist who hates God, who hates Jesus Christ, who hates the word of God, who hates the law of God, who's doing everything you can to overturn the law of God and promote perversion and sodomite rights and, and murdering of innocents. We must keep in mind that the antithesis between the world and Christ is coming to a head. For the world can not tolerate any religion or worldview <clears throat> Excuse me, the world can tolerate any religion or worldview except biblical Christianity. The secular humanist atheist and the radical Muslim who wants to slice off your head are covenantal brothers. They're both under Satan. They have a lot in common. Yes, Satan's kingdom has, has its own factions and divisions, but they're, they both have everything in common and they can get along. And Obama is promoting Islam in Na at NASA, for example, trying to get them to be friendly with it, Muslims. But they cannot tolerate biblical Christianity for it's exclusive. Christ is exclusive. He alone is God. He alone requires absolute faith, devotion, worship, and service. There is none besides him. You worship Christ, you worship Christ alone. You bow to the knee before him as God and God alone. The triune God of Scripture. There is no other besides Him. Christ and God will not tolerate pluralism or competition or syncretism with false gods. It is for this reason that the Roman Senate, prior to Constantine, refused to acknowledge Christ as God or place Him in their pantheon. 
any crazy god of the, of, of the ancient world, no matter how ridiculous it was, they would, oh, we'll incorporate that into the pantheon. We'll incorporate that into the gods. They had no problem with that. But not Christ. We can't tolerate Christ. They understood enough about Christianity that they said, if we acknowledge Jesus to be God, then we can have no other gods because he will not allow us to acknowledge any other gods. They understood that. That's why they murdered Christians. You could worship a banana. You could worship a dog. You could worship anything you wanted in the ancient world. As long as you bowed the knee before Caesar and gave a little pinch of incense to Caesar and said, Caesar is Lord over lords and God over gods. If you were willing to do that, you could worship anything. And that's how the, that's how the empire functioned. Christians said, no, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord over lords. He's king over kings. He's Lord over lords. Besides him, there is no other. And they said, you must die. And if you study the martyrs of the, fir uh, of the first century and the second century and, the, and so forth, you'll see that all they had to do to get out of being put to death was say, Caesar's Lord. They just had to acknowledge that Caesar was, had the authority. Caesar was a god. And they wouldn't do it. If we acknowledge Christ, we must acknowledge no other. To follow Jesus of Nazareth means the pantheon must be torn down. And by the way, that building still exists. And it was used as a church for quite a while. But it still exists. It was a beautiful building. One of the first buildings with a dome. And its light it has a giant hole in the middle of the dome. And if you go there and it rains, you've got to stay out of the middle because it rains in the middle. But it's still there. It was this dogmatic exclusivity, coupled with God's holy and righteous character and holy and righteous law, that caused men to hate God and to hate his Christ. People hate God, people hate Christ, people hate the law. Whenever you see anyone contradict the law of God or say anything against the law of God, they're attacking God's character. When people say, oh, homosexual rights, it's fine. They're attacking God. They're attacking the Bible. They're attacking Jesus Christ. World Vision, which used to be a Christian organization, is just okayed sodomite marriage and their acceptance of homosexuality. Well, World Vision hates God now, and they should not be given a penny. The secular humanists, socialists, feminists, sodomites, and atheistic naturalists who run our civil government, our state schools, our universities, and our courts, they can tolerate modernist forms of Christianity. And anti antinomian forms of the faith but they have a supreme hatred of those who consistently hold the sola scriptura, the mediatorial kingship of Christ and the whole moral law of God. You say, well, why aren't Christians being persecuted in our country? They're not worth being persecuted. They're not a threat. They don't believe in the law of God. They hate the law of God, most Christians. They don't believe in the kingship of Christ. That's something for the future. This world belongs to the devil. The Christian church is not being persecuted in the United States because it's not worth persecuting. It's not, it's not a nuisance to the state. Not yet. When revival comes, persecution will come. However, those strict Christians who do not bow the knee on homosexuality will be persecuted, probably in our own lifetime. They can accept professing Christians who accept the myth of neutrality and are happy to restrict the lordship of Christ to the four walls of a church or the prayer closet. They can accept that. They will gladly share the stage with churchmen who are happy to give the robes of society over to Satanists. Yeah, Billy Graham, come on up here. Come on up here while we have our little pluralism. George W. Bush after 9-11, where they've got a Muslim praying over here. They've got Muslims and Hindus and Christians and this and that, Jews all together, as if they all are speaking the truth when they're nothing but a bunch of antichrists. But we must have no part with such compromise. If we are consistent and preach the biblical Christ, the true and living God and genuine Christian ethics, the world will hate us as it hated and continues to hate Jesus Christ. So if you're a friend with the world, if the world thinks you're great and you're on Oprah Winfrey and you're on Dr. Phil and they're talking about how great you are and they're promoting your book like Joel Olstein, then you'll know that you're a false prophet. 
Because you're not talking about sin, you're not talking about the law, you're not talking about the holiness and righteousness of God, you're not talking about the cross of Christ, you're talking about self-esteem, and you're talking about how to have a better life now, how to make money, how to get wealth. Christianity is getting wealth. You're not going to see R.C. Sproul on one of these shows. And he's not even as radical as he should be. We must seek to live with our heathen neighbors in peace, no doubt. Live at peace with all men, if, if at all possible. But we must also consistently hold and teach the whole counsel of God, which is, which is exceptionally offensive to the natural man. It's exceptionally offensive to pagan society. The teachings of the Bible and the teachings of the law of God and the teachings of biblical consistent Christianity are extremely radical and offensive to people today. The world says that homosexual behavior and homosexual marriage is a good thing. The entertainment industries, Hollywood, Broadway, the fashion industry, it's full of sodomites. It's full of homosexual perverts. We should tolerate and even honor such, quote, loving relationships. They are in love, after all. They're in love. The Bible says that it is a vile sin, a wicked abomination, and homosexuals must be put to death by the civil magistrate. That's what the Bible says, and that's what you should be saying. You should be able to turn on the TV, and when you see these stupid talk shows where they get a, quote, so-called conservative on there, he should be saying, yes, and we, we as Christians, we believe that every homosexual uh, who is properly prosecuted with evidence should be put to death. That's what God requires. That's what God thinks of this. It's not a virtuous thing. It's disgusting. The world says that every woman should have the right to choose whether or not she bears a child. Well, she has a right to choose. Abortion must be legal. It must be safe. It, and preferably, it must be state-subsidized. So poor women can get abortions, too. Everybody can get abortions. The Bible says that abortion is first-degree murder. Yes, it's first-degree murder. It's premeditated murder. It's premeditated murder of an infant. It's premeditated murder of a child. It's the most supreme, disgusting, unlawful form of child abuse that people can imagine. If it is done, the woman, the doctor... The nurses, the receptionist, and any other accomplices should be prosecuted, and they should all be put to death. Every one of them. They should all be put to death. The security guard standing out front guarding the clinic, the nurses, the doctors, the office workers, the clerks, every one of them should be put to death because they're all accomplices to first-degree murder. If somebody robs a liquor store and you're driving the car and you never leave the car and that guy goes in there and he shoots everybody in the liquor store, you're guilty of murder. And you should be put to death. Same with abortion. That's what the Bible says. That's what God says. People of this world hate God because his law and his gospel tells them what they really are. And they don't want to know that. They don't want people telling them that. As a man with a hideously deformed face smashes every mirror within his house, the people of the world want to kill God and they want to kill Christ and put them out of their consciousness. If there was a button to suppress the true knowledge of God and Christ, the unbeliever, the unregenerate man is pressing that button every moment of every day. They attack God by attacking his people. The enemies of God are the enemies of God's people. And we should keep the following verses in our mind. Here's one. Matthew 10, 22 and 25. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. If they have call, called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? 
That's Matthew 10, 22 and 25b. Here's one. Matthew 24, 9 to 10. Then they, and in context, the nations, plural, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. And here's John 15, 18 to 19. <clears throat> if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, would, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So if you're hanging out with unbelievers, they think you're wonderful. You got a serious problem. And then third, our text, our text makes it very clear that figuratively speaking, there are times when Jehovah appears to be asleep unto his enemies. And if you were paying attention to the, song, the two, two of the Psalms we sang this morning, they didn't use the same terminology, but that's what they were talking about. You see this. Where God's people are getting hammered and they're saying, Lord, crush these guys. Help us. The fact that he is described as sleeping or that he appears to be uh, doing little to nothing against his enemies is proved by the announcement and or petition to awake. Arising as opposed to sleeping. Christ, Jehovah or Christ, the mediatorial king, is pictured taking decisive action against his enemies after a period of relative inactivity regarding judgment and spiritual conquest. That's what's being pictured here. God and his Christ appear to be asleep when his many enemies blaspheme his name, revile his covenant people, repudiate and mock his holy law, reject his precious son and glorious gospel, persist in wicked behavior, and grow progressively more worldly, unethical, and rebellious over time, and yet God and Christ do not take decisive action against such behavior during a period of history. Okay, we're in kind of a period now. Now, we acknowledge there are minor judgments that are occurring all the time, but we're talking about a major hammering, which is what our nation deserves and what Europe deserves and what Russia deserves and what the world deserves right now. This is clearly a doctrine of Scripture and a fact of history. And it is the reason that the Psalms contain respectful sorrowful complaints or petitions of what appears to be divine desertion during periods of prevalent power cruelty and the derisive contempt of God's enemies toward Jehovah and his people. You see it in the Psalms over and over. Here's one example, Psalm 44, 26, uh, 22 to 26. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 23, awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. Now here's a situation where Israel has not been unfaithful to the Lord. Okay, this, is not, this is not a situation where they've turned their back on God and they're being judged. Yet her, here her enemies are prospering and afflicted upon her. Greatly disturbed by the seeming discrepancy, the psalmist lays the whole issue before the Lord with earnest prayer for help. It is clearly understood that such things do not occur outside of the boundaries of God's sovereign will. The suffering was therefore in the nature of a cross that they were to bear. And there are many such situations in life when God's people find it exceptionally difficult and even impossible this side of heaven to understand the way of God in the sovereign course he at times takes. 
Why am I suffering? Why is this happening? And we see that this is in Scripture. We should not be surprised by these kind of things. Now, if we study Scripture, we see that it does give reasons why Jehovah appears to slumber when his enemies are active. <clears throat> and here are some of the more obvious reasons. And I think this is a very long section. I think what we'll do is take a break here and we'll come back and look because this is something that we need to understand. There are periods in history where God appears to be asleep. There are periods of his, history where the church is doing terrible and declining and getting worse. And society around us is getting worse and worse and worse and our enemies are getting more and more powerful. And people are going, what's going on? Why are you sleeping, Lord? Well, we're going to look at that when we come back. Because there are periods where God appears as, he, as, he, as if he's sleeping. And there's reasons for that. And they're good reasons that we should understand, we should, we should know. It'll strengthen our faith when these periods occur. And, which is the main point of our passage today, it's going to strengthen our prayers. Praying for the destruction of God's enemies, praying for God to rise up and strike them, should be part of your prayer life. Now, I know that that goes against everything that modern, effeminate, degenerate Christianity says, but we reject modern, effeminate, degenerate evangelicalism, and we embrace the Psalms, and we embrace the Word of God. And you have to understand, one of the main reasons that Isaac Watts, one of his main tasks in life was to get rid of this book of Psalms, because he hated this kind of doctrine. He hated this kind of teaching, and he thought it was unchristian. And so he substituted a paraphrased version of the Psalms, and then he substituted a hymn book for the Psalms. It takes all this kind of speech out. And what has it done? It's made the church more wimpish and effeminate. We need this kind of teaching. Why do you think God wants us to be singing the Psalms instead of man-made hymns? Well, because man-made hymns tend to be humanistic, non-doctrinal, and crummy, where the Psalms are balanced. We sang two Psalms this morning that were on this theme. And we see this theme all the time in the Psalms. So we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back, and we're going to deal with this more thoroughly. It'll help you understand why things are the way they are right now why we need to be praying for victory, why we need to be, be praying for God to crush his enemies. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful passage. Arise, Lord. Arise. Wake your church up, Lord, from its declension, its slumber, its pluralism, its compromise of this world. Judgment begins at the household of God, and we ask, Lord, that you would wake up and strike those wicked reprobates, those wicked people who promote homosexual marriage and feminism, who promote abortion, who promote socialism, who promote state schools, who promote statism. Strike them, Lord. Crush them, Messiah, King of kings, for the sake of your church, for the sake of your name, for the sake of your honor. For they blaspheme your holy name, Lord. They blaspheme your holy law. They blaspheme your Bible. They speak against you. They speak against your law. They say that you're unjust. They mock you, Lord. Arise against them and crush them. In your mighty wrath and indignation, fill up the cup of their wrath and make them drink the bitter dregs to the full, Lord, that your name and your son especially will be glorified and exalted among the nations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.